Since last week, all eyes have been focused on the Middle East, not only because of our inexorable bond with Israel, but because of Syria's abuse of power. As of last night, the Senate Foreign Relations Panel has approved a resolution on military action, yet no international steps have been taken, only worldwide acknowledgement of a horror so cruel that it defies reason. For Jews, the merciless attack of a government turning against its own citizens evokes a strong visceral response. Before the Syrian crisis, in our own country, we were having different kinds of discussions about power, about voters' rights, about the role of women, about same-sex marriage, and most notably, about race. Fifty years ago at the Great March for Jobs and Freedom, Rabbi Joachim Prince of the American Jewish Congress address the marchers with these words. When I was a rabbi of the Jewish community in Berlin under the Hitler regime, I learned many things. The most important thing I learned under those tragic circumstances was that bigotry and hatred are not the most urgent problem. The most urgent, the most disgraceful, the most shameful, and the most tragic problem is silence. His statement could apply to any of the categories or issues that we care about. We're standing up for what we believe is decent and moral and can help move the conversation to a different place. In the aftermath of Trayvon Martin's death when President Obama said, he could have been my son, the country caught a glimpse behind a door which is normally closed, and at best, a jar, a door separating power and privilege from bullying and discrimination. Spoken with the insight of experience and the empathy of a parent, were his comments meant to initiate a national conversation? 50 years after Martin Luther King's dream speech, or simply air the feelings of so many who feel or have felt the sting of powerlessness and the dangers that may accompany it. We as Jews have embraced powerlessness as one of our key identifying motifs. Ask any religious school age student and they will tell you we were strangers in Egypt. We were slaves in Egypt, subjects to Pharaoh. Each Passover, when the story of the Exodus is retold, we couch it in the first person, for each of us is to feel that we personally have been redeemed. As such, having personal knowledge of both bondage and freedom, we have traditionally felt a kinship with those who are oppressed. In her work on Jews and power, Dr. Ruth Weiss notes that throughout history, Jews have been dependent on the generosity of the ruling party and the foreign nations where they have chosen to live, with limited access to the larger society. Excluded from the mainstream, the military, political office, and even from owning property, they worked in the narrowly defined trades made available that served the established community and made their lives largely one of service. Within that carefully defined existence, a Jew would not be likely to challenge the tolerance of a nation whose goodwill afforded protection. But acceptance, full acceptance, always seemed to elude our ancestors. As recently as World War II, that isolation began to change. Rabbi Michael Berenbaum, former director of the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, commented on the vivid differences between two types of Jews who lived under vastly different circumstances those who were helpless victims, 
versus those who participated in the war as liberators. What emerged was an appreciation for what it means to have autonomy, authority for one's own well-being and emerging power. Thereafter, with the establishment of Israel as a sovereign state, Jews worldwide felt more empowered and secure. No longer was a Jew dependent on the generosity of a host nation for survival, for safety, or anything else. Israelis rebuilt a land and revived a language. As Israel grew, Israeli Jews finally had the opportunity to populate every avenue of society, along with the development of a well-respected military, really a first in Jewish life. Powerless no more. And Jews in every nation around the globe stood a bit taller as a result. Our American experience in the last couple of generations differs from the rest of our history, which is not to say that it was easy or uncomplicated, but for the sake of this discussion, it's important to recognize that our acceptance into the larger society was not at the expense of our collective memory. Even as we gained authority and power, we remained aware of our historic and continued vulnerability. We kept an eye on social justice, not only because it's right, but because we knew from our history how precarious our current good fortune might be. We remembered our past, even as we embraced the future. Indeed, the historic partnership of the 1950s and 60s between blacks and Jews in areas of social justice was based largely on the implied commonality stemming from a shared legacy of discrimination and even slavery, and the self-perception of being an outsider, accurate or not, which is why the Trayvon Martin case is still evocative for us as Jews. But unlike the death of Emmett Till in 1955, which set off the Montgomery bus boycott and the civil rights movement in which so many Jews took part, there's something different about the way we perceive Trayvon Martin's death, because in the intervening years, we have become more secure in our identity. While the international communities grapple with the dynamics of stabilizing the Middle East, and our national dialogue may currently center on the subject of race, writ smaller, for us, perhaps the subject has become one of our own privilege and power. For Jews in America, there's never before been a time that we have been so successful. We enjoy access to education, professional worlds, political office, along with the ability to speak freely and without concern. These benefits and privileges mark our arrival. Power is at the very heart of this holy season. On Rosh Hashanah, as we celebrate God's sovereignty, the vastness of God's creation, we are urged to use these next 10 days to examine our own use of power, the review of where we have succeeded and where we've fallen short, culminates in one of the most important statements of communal confession. For the sin which we have committed by abuse of power. The traditional liturgy has 44 expressions. The early reform movement pared it down to the most essential. And power stayed stayed in our liturgy. It's no accident that the saga of Abraham and Sarah's family life is central to the holiday narrative. 
It's a close-up view of how power can shape and reshape the course of one's life, as told from the intimacy of the first Jewish family. The Sarah that we have come to know is the newly empowered Sarah. It's because of her efforts that the covenant was carried through Isaac as determined by God. But getting there to that point contributed to the woman she became. As you know, Sarah originally derived her authority from her marriage to Abraham, as was true of all women of that time. But Sarah found that she was infertile, which was a barrier to their future as well as a blow to her esteem. And when Sarah turned her maid Hagar into her surrogate, and Hagar gave birth to Ishmael, a child with Abraham, Sarah was bumped from her privileged status. And their changed power dynamic predictably led to household discord. Sarah sought to restore her primacy and did so at great cost. After Isaac was born, she banished both Hagar and her child Ishmael from their shared household, essentially to die in the desert. Our individual analysis of this ancient story is a prompt to reconsider the dynamics in our own intimate circles of association. How are we like Sarah in her attempt to ameliorate a sorrowful situation? She lost her standing and could only restore herself by exercising, and some say by abusing her authority. In what ways are we like Hagar? Having moved up the ladder, she chose to give Sarah a taste of her own medicine, treating her as poorly as she had been treated. Once Hagar had the upper hand, could she have risen above her anger? How are we like Abraham, the parent of two boys, the partner of two rivals, who stood by quietly observing but not interfering? even when Hagar and their son were placed, displaced from their home. At the heart of this story is the admonition about power that is used as a cudgel. At the same time, readers will always wonder why Abraham, God's chosen one, was silent here when he had the courage to argue with God for the sake of Sodom and Gomorrah to make God take a second look at the city that was about to be destroyed. Yet where was Abraham's empathy for his own flesh and blood? The age-old holiday warning about Hosek Yad, abuse of power, is not only about going too far, but like Abraham in this instance, about failing to act. If we were to take a second look at how power is used in our own circle of association, what would we say to the coworker who only plays by one set of rules, his own, and so dominates and alienates other people? And when we recognize the pattern of someone who manipulates things behind the scenes, setting up others for a fall, and then steps in to claim or fill the void she created? Do we call her on it? How do we respond to the persistent individual who harps on something relentlessly until he gets his way, recognizing that bullying is not a phenomenon that ends with childhood? And at home, how do we shield ourselves from responsibility or involvement or even discord by hiding behind work? Do we willingly omit ourselves from the equation by being tethered to our smartphones and tablets, thereby taking advantage of those we love? 
As is the case with many commandments, often there's little question when a bright line has been crossed. Misuse of power is deeply troubling, but recognizable. But the unspoken message of Hosek Yad is the failure to use the power we have. As a sin of omission, it can be just as damaging. On Yom Kippur, we make this message explicit with the words from the Holiness Code, Lo ta'amod al damre echa, don't stand by while your neighbor bleeds. To do so goes against our instinct, but let us also remember that commandments are given for a reason. It might seem that they're stating the obvious, but their existence reveals insight into human behavior, which requires ongoing guidance. Based on this biblical moral law, in 1998, Israeli law specified and expanded the circumstances and the penalty incurred should one fail to attempt to help another in dire circumstances. The courts noted, indeed, it's not usually the case that provision is made for punishment for an offense that is committed by omission, by inaction. However, standing idly by is not merely standing passively by. Rather, it's a blunt and serious expression of estrangement from and disregard for human life, and it therefore deserves a suitable punishment where necessary. Beyond the law, what moves us to respond? In a word, it is empathy. Empathy has been called the glue of social interactions. Yet in an article entitled, When Power Goes to Your Head, It May Shut Out Your Heart, researchers report that as an individual becomes more secure and less dependent on others, their behavior is less likely to take into account the feeling of others. The axiom that empathy is like a muscle, the more you use it, the bigger it gets, is precisely why we need a regular reminder to keep it in shape. Our ancestors must have anticipated this feeling of disconnection when they created liturgy which reminds us, no matter where or what our circumstances, that we were slaves in Egypt, a time of disempowerment. By taking a second look at the servitude and desperation of the past, identifying with it as if it were part of our current experience, we renew the feelings associated with it. And as we rehearse the emotions, we also increase our capacity to feel compassion for someone else who suffers. This reinforces the best of our moral tradition. Elie Wiesel captured this beautifully when he said, I swore never to be silent whenever or wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. We must always take sides. Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. There may be times when we are powerless to prevent injustice, but there must never be a time when we fail to protest. What Wiesel has learned through his own experience is that when we fail to speak up, we lose our humanity. As recently as Saturday afternoon, the President spoke about his authority as Commander-in-Chief which he coupled with the voices of the nation. He said then that he would wait to hear from the people's representatives before he used the power of his office to act. Only then would he be able to take a second look weighing all the information at hand. The Holiness Code urges us not to stand by without doing something. So the time to speak is now. 
Your voice is the source of our nation's strength as well as the brake on its actions. Power threads through every social issue of our day, and speaking truth to power puts us squarely in line with our tradition, like the prophets of old. On Monday, the Union for Reform Judaism sent a note to all Reform congregations asking for our help in making a decision to support or oppose the resolution President Obama will present to Congress this coming Monday. And this is where you come in Jewishly. You have a chance to speak your mind Jewishly. The Religious Action Center website has posted background resources and opinion pieces that are equally divided on both sides of the decision. And you are urged to read widely and then share your carefully considered opinions through a link on their website. It's the Religious Action Center, and here is their web address. It's an acronym for Religious Action Center, R-A-C, dot org forward slash Syria. That will take you to the correct page. Please be sure to share your voice before Monday afternoon, September 9th. Possessing power in and of itself isn't wrong or evil, nor is it a cause for guilt, yet it comes with responsibility. At its best, power makes things possible. It transforms potential into reality. And it's this power that should occupy our reflections this Holy Day season. This is our chance to take a second look at our own behavior, our family, our workplace, and our responsibilities to our nation as we consider how to use our authority and where and when we need to act, let us remember that we were strangers in the land of Egypt. Power, what are you going to do with yours?